how much would you pay for a bottle of whiskey? How about $435,273? That's how much a buyer paid at a Sotheby's auction last year for a 52-year-old bottle of Japanese whiskey. 50,000, 60,000, 70,000, 80,000, 90,000, 100,000, 180,000. And while that might be an extreme example, it's definitely not the only one. Japanese whiskey just keeps getting more expensive. In 2014, one 14-year-old bottle from a Japanese distillery sold for just a few hundred bucks. Now it costs almost $10,000. That's more than $650 a glass. Now, it wasn't always like this. After debuting in the mid-20th century, Japanese whiskey toiled in obscurity for years. No one liked it at home, and no one cared about it abroad. It was only once Japanese whiskeys started getting global acclaim that sales began to soar. In 2015, one whiskey ranking named a Yamazaki single malt the best whiskey in the world. The judge called it near indescribable genius. So, okay, Japanese whiskey is all the rage and the good stuff is really good. There's just one problem. There's no technical definition of Japanese whiskey or formal system to regulate it. That means a lot of Japanese whiskey doesn't actually come from Japan at all. This is The Court's Obsession, a podcast that explores the fascinating backstories behind everyday ideas and what they tell us about the global economy. I'm your host, Kira Bindrim. Today, Japanese whiskey and what happens when a national product becomes an international hit. I'm joined now by Tim McDonald, who is actually Quartz's climate and energy reporter and who recently moved to Cairo. Thank you for joining me, Tim. How is Cairo? It's very hot. (laughs) Cairo is great. I've only been here for a few months, but I passed my first exam in my Arabic class this morning with flying colors. So I'm feeling good about that. Whoa, congrats. Yeah, shukran. That's great. So you are an American who is based in Egypt who is also talking today about Japanese whiskey. So that's a real threefer of of global interests. Tell me how you got interested in this particular topic. (laughs) I don't consider myself a whiskey aficionado, but I I do enjoy drinking whiskey. When I lived in Washington, D.C., I was friends with the owner of our sort of neighborhood liquor store, and he had a great selection of Japanese whiskeys, actually. And so I tried a few of them that were there, Suntory and Nika, and that was kind of my first introduction. But I had no idea about any of the backstory, any of the history. That was all new to me in, in working on this story. So that was all really exciting. Okay, well, maybe we can start with some of the basics. What makes whiskey whiskey? The most basic question. <laughs> what is whiskey? What's the answer? <laughs> So whiskey is a distilled malt beverage. It it has a brown color. It's aged in oak barrels. It's delicious. There's a few different kinds. You have scotch coming from Scotland, obviously has a sort of heavy uh, peat kind of taste. You have American bourbon, um, which is a little bit more on the sweet side. Japanese whiskey kind of comes from a Scottish tradition, but is also very experimental. And um, yeah, I mean, that's the very basic definition, I guess. What distinguishes Japanese whiskey? Like, is it made a different way? Does it just taste different? What is meant to set it apart from other whiskeys? So in a lot of ways, you know, Japanese whiskey is not fundamentally different from scotch, but it is aged in a different kind of oak. There's a Mizunara is the the type of oak that the barrels are typically made from in Japan. You know, in the Japanese whiskeys that I've sampled, I find... um, are a little bit lighter on the palate than scotch. They're not quite so peat heavy. They're, they're very versatile in that sense. So they're actually really great. So generally the the wood of the casks is different or a specific type of wood, and they tend to be lighter and less sweet than some of the Scottish or American competitors. Is that sort of the right? That's a good summary. Yep. Okay. I want to go back to the origin story of Japanese whiskey in Japan. But first I thought maybe I would do some journalism, by which I mean um, sip some Japanese whiskey in real time for research purposes. Okay. (laughs) Okay, I have a Suntory Toki, and I have an EY45. Am I saying that right? I think so. Those are my options. Which one do you think I should start with? We could start maybe with the the Suntory. Um, I mean, I I feel like a a place to start is just by 
looking at it, I mean, you can kind of talk about the appearance. I know the Suntory, I think, is um, lighter in color compared to the other one. It is. It is. Yeah. I would describe the Suntory as the amber from Jurassic Park that the mosquito is in. <laughs> That's what I would write in my official review. <laughs> so this is this is one that, you know, probably anyone who's listening, if you go to your local liquor store, this is going to be one that you're almost certain to find. It's kind of probably the most common Japanese whiskey that you'll find in America. But yeah, I'm, I'm interested to know what you think about it, Kira. I'm not drinking out of an official whiskey glass, which I know is a thing, right? You're supposed to have a, a sifter of some sort. But I am smelling it. And? How's the smell? It doesn't make me not want to drink it, which is like a real uh, <laughs> powerful compliment for, for <laughs> liquor for me. Ooh, that's quite tasty. So what are you getting from it? It's light. It's not, I, I mean, I feel like I'm drinking liquor because it's got the, I'm getting the little like warm burn down your throat, mm -hmm. but not in a like bleh way, in a like pleasant way. You know, the fact that it's, um, you're not feeling that it's overpowering or or too heavy, uh, I think is is very typical. Okay, I'm ready for my second whiskey. So this one's a little bit darker. It's actually, so I'm sitting at like kind of a almost like teak table and it's it's it matches nicely. <laughs> the table, they pair nicely. Does it smell different at all or? It's not as, pun like the smell doesn't feel as strong to me. Mm, interesting. Ooh, the taste is interesting on that one. Do you feel like you're getting any of the like, what about coconut, for example? Is that is that coming through at all or any like incense kind yeah, of flavor? Yeah, and the, it's a lot more in the like upfront taste versus the finish. Mm. Like I thought the first one hit me a little more in like the three seconds after I drank it. This one's like right in the mouth. Well, that is tasty. Okay, I feel much more qualified to participate in this conversation. Yes, now. that that can launch us off into the rest of the conversation. Let's go back to some of the origin story of Japanese whiskey. Um, when roughly <laughs> did uh, did whiskey arrive in Japan? So the very earliest arrival of, of whiskey in Japan actually goes back you know, well before um, whiskey was being produced in Japan, the, the first barrels of whiskey to arrive in Japan actually came from the U.S. Naval Commander um, Matthew Perry, uh, who was on a diplomatic mission and had brought some whiskey in barrels, presumably for him and his sailors' own enjoyment, but also as a, as a gift uh, for people that they were there to, to do business with. Uh, this was in the 1850s. I mean, this is important because it did start as an import and it also started very much as a, a drink for the elite. It wasn't until a few decades later that um, some Japanese beverage entrepreneurs um, started to import distilling equipment. There became this desire to see, you know, what if we could actually distill some of this stuff ourselves? So you had a sake brewer, um, Setsu Shozu, who had one of his young employees, a gentleman by the name of Masataka Takatsuru, who was a chemist working in this uh, sake brewery. And he was dispatched by his employer to go to Scotland and learn this trade of um, whiskey distilling. And he set up shop there, traveled around to a number of distilleries over the course of a couple of years, met a Scottish woman by the name of Rita and married her and convinced her to actually come back with him to Japan and uh, take a job with um, a different wine distributor, this one by the name of Shinjiro Tori, who they became sort of business partners. So um, Takatsuru was kind of coming at this from the chemistry side. He was the distiller, the sort of craftsman. And then his business partner, Tori, was more on the distribution side, the business side, more of the entrepreneur. He traditionally dealt in wine, but was very keen to make this pivot into whiskey. So they made a very natural pairing. And they together set up Yamazaki, which was the the country's first whiskey distillery and, you know, almost 100 years later would be the, the very same distillery to produce the whiskey that you mentioned earlier, Kira, that, that won this Whiskey Bible Award as the, the world's best whiskey. So that took about not quite a century for them, the distillery that they set up there to dominate the world. But that's kind of where it, it all got started. So from like the 1850s to the early 1900s, it's really only existing through trade and people who are bringing it in as like a foreign drink. And there are distilleries in Japan, but not for an imported liquor like this, maybe for sake and for wine and things like that. And then these two guys come and they set up this first distillery after having spent, one of them spent time in Scotland. And then that becomes, you know, one of these giant brands. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and so the distillery we talked about at the end there, that's Suntory, the one that they set up? Yeah, it had a different name. I think originally they it was just referred to as the the, the name of the distillery is Yamazaki. And um, I, the company went through iterations over time, but its roots are ultimately the, the company that we know today as Suntory. So that's the oldest and largest 
distillery in, in Japan. They eventually split off into different rival shops. And so Takatsuru, who was the chemist, the, the original sort of distiller, he left. He set up his own company uh, called Nika, which you know is a, another brand that people may be familiar with today. These two, um, Suntory and Nika, have been sort of neck and neck in terms of both the domestic whiskey market in Japan and also internationally. We've been talking a lot about the prices of Japanese whiskey, and we're generally talking about the price of Japanese whiskey outside of Japan. In Japan, I'm tentatively assuming that it's cheaper because it's local, but is the price point particularly high or is it pretty, you know, standard? You know, these shops, Nika and Suntory, some of their earliest customers domestically were actually not Japanese drinkers at all, but were actually American military officers who were stationed in Japan who missed the the sort of bourbon or missed the taste of home and were early customers for Nika and for Suntory. And it was in the sort of decades after that when whiskey sort of disseminated more widely out into society. And this was a period of incredible growth for these two brands, Nika and Suntory, and also others that came onto the scene at this time. Over the course of these few decades from the, the sort of the 1950s into the 1980s, um, consumption volume of whiskey domestically in Japan grew more than 500%. So it's kind of taking off and really taking root as a as a beverage that people are finding in neighborhood restaurants and, and just sort of drinking normally. Part of this whole process of developing the, the domestic market for Japanese whiskey has often relied on foreign messengers uh, to deliver the marketing message. So there's an amazing collection of ads out there you can find on the internet, TV ads from over time, where the, the spokespeople are Sammy Davis Jr., um, Sean Connery, Suntory Crest and I. Keanu Reeves. Orson Welles was another very early one, as early as the 1970s. If you've seen the movie Lost in Translation, the whole movie is premised on Bill Murray going to Japan to record a television commercial for Suntory. For relaxing times, make it Suntory time. That is is really based on, you know, a very real long tradition of Suntory commercials starring you know, white male foreign actors. And, you know, despite everything that we are talking about, it remains true to this day that for Suntory and for Nika and for other uh, distillers, this local domestic market remains the cash cow. It's still the biggest part of their customer base is is domestic. We'll put the link in the in the show notes because that Sammy Davis commercial is just perfection. This conversation is fascinating, Tim. We will be right back. Now, two things I know about whiskey are that one, quality is important, and two, age is important, and those things are related. How do they play into Japanese whiskey in particular? Uh, when you look at any bottle of, of whiskey, whether it's from Japan or anywhere else, very often it will have an age statement on it, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. These are the, the, the length of time that the whiskey has spent aging in this oak barrel. I think most people agree that there's a sort of direct correlation between the amount of time that it spends in the barrel and the value. And what was really interesting in, in the story of Japanese whiskey is that there was this kind of explosion of interest internationally in Japanese whiskey at a time when the industry was not necessarily prepared for that. Once these whiskeys started to win international awards and start to appear in international whiskey guidebooks and Japanese whiskey kind of becomes this whole thing, they started to sell out of the older whiskeys much more quickly than I think anyone anticipated. I mean, when you have a product that has to sit in a barrel for you know, 10 or more years before it can be ready, if you suddenly overnight have this boom in demand, there's really not much you can do. <laughs> you can't speed that process up. You can't just make more whiskey overnight. The Japanese whiskeys that you see that have these price points that are more in the thousands or tens of thousands or like crazy price points, these are the ones that have age statements. They are more than 10 years old. They sort of date back to, they would have gone into a barrel, you know, sometime in the early 2000s, late 90s, at a time when there was a very limited international market for Japanese whiskey, and it, it did not have anything like the reputation that it has today. The two that you have sampled today, I think they do not have age statements on them. Is that correct? No, they don't have anything 
noting age. You, you know, one of the interesting things is that I think Japanese distillers have a very good reputation as as blenders. And so they, they're able to take whiskeys, you know, from Japan or that are imported and, and mix them in different interesting combinations and do a lot of great stuff. I mean, the two whiskeys that you sampled did not have age statements, but it sounded like you enjoyed them. So, you know, it's, it's not to say that if it doesn't have an age statement, that it's terrible. But the journey that this industry on is one of trying to kind of get back to a place where they can sort of catch up with these age statements. And, you know, maybe as we follow this industry in the next five or 10 years, hopefully, you know, you'll start to see that those age labels, 10, 12 years, start to become more common in the export product. And the price for those kind of comes back down into more of a normal um, sub $100 kind of range. What you just said is um, Japanese whiskey is known for being well blended, and that makes it possible to use imported whiskey, which makes my little red alarms go off because aren't we talking about Japanese whiskey? Where is the the, um, the cheap end coming from? And it sounds like maybe the answer is is ironically imports. Yeah, so this is kind of a controversial thing with Japanese whiskey. So they've they've been looking obviously for ways to plug this supply gap. And one of the key ways that they do that is by importing whiskey from Scotland or from America or from other producers elsewhere in the world and blending it and then putting a label on it that says that it's Japanese and then exporting it back out again. And, you know, you could make an argument that there is certainly an art to the blending process, but I think there's a lot of consternation among, you know, real whiskey aficionados and among, you know, those who are kind of following this industry closely that, uh, you know, a lot of what we actually see as being Japanese is is not actually Japanese in the sense that it was not actually originally distilled in Japan. It's a sort of recycled product that then comes back from abroad. You know, if you if you think about scotch or you think about you know, champagne, for example, these are beverages that are very closely associated with their terroir, their, their geographic origin. And scotch producers in Scotland or champagne producers in uh, France are extremely sensitive and protective about that label and spend a lot of time and effort and money, you know, lobbying to keep those regulations in place. In Japan, there's not a legally binding definition of what constitutes Japanese whiskey. Um, it's more of just sort of a, a descriptor, but not one that, that has a lot of weight behind it necessarily. There's an argument to be made that putting that kind of regulation in place would sort of protect the brand, could help protect Japanese producers and, and maybe give a kind of market edge. But at the same time, my understanding is that you know, whiskey trade groups in Japan are actually not in favor of this the type of regulatory protection that their peers in Scotland or France or elsewhere tend to seek out because they're, they're, they're not really in a place to be able to fully provide the demand that's out there with the product that they're able to produce themselves. So this has become kind of a controversial and, and touchy thing uh, in, in the industry. It's, it's a, just a question of transparency, right? It's like you could have a very excellent distillery in Japan that, you know, maybe does magical things with blending. And that's great. But I do think there's a, a case to be made for having a bit more transparency in the labeling and not necessarily calling this thing Japanese whiskey, when in fact, what you're really drinking is uh, an American whiskey that was blended in Japan or, you know, something like that, or rebottled in Japan or, or something like that. You know, it's, it's something that the industry is going to have to continue to grapple with over the next several years as it continues to sort of catch up on the age labels and, and the supply gap. Where does the transparency or sort of the like quality control question come up against this awards thing that we've been talking about? Like it's clear that in the last couple of years, Japanese whiskeys or some of them have gained enough legitimacy to be winning, you know, best whiskey in the world and things like that. Tell me a little bit about these awards. <laughs> like what, how, how important are they? Uh, it seems like a very sort of insular industry. And so I get the sense that they're pretty important, but also where has it come up um, or has it come up in the context of awards that Japan does not have a process or there isn't a process to really technically define Japanese whiskey? Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the whiskeys that are winning awards and, you know, are sort of center stage and and in the spotlight internationally are are not the lower end 
uh, you know, blended ones that that we're really talking about. I mean, these these are still the higher end, you know, what what you might call true Japanese whiskeys. And the Japanese whiskeys have sort of skyrocketed to international fame on the basis of these awards that some of them are winning. But then, if you as a regular uh, shopper in the U.S. Um, or Europe, go to your local liquor store and look for a whiskey. You know, it's not to say that they that none of them are truly Japanese or that they're all bogus, but there's a decent chance that unless you're shelling out quite a bit of money, what's in your glass at the end of the day is not actually originating in Japan. This is all super interesting to me because I think inevitably when you have a local product that goes global, it's going to lose some of its quality, if not literally the quality, then some of the original identity that, you know, made it famous in the first place. So it's interesting when you have a product like whiskey, where the definition of quality is so specific. And it kind of raises this question to me about the trade-offs of going global, like you will lose some of that identity or potentially expose the fact that that identity um, wasn't fully formed in the first place. But also, like one of the things you're alluding to is transparency is good, but so is maybe expanding your definition of what is considered good. And it, it sounds like maybe over time with whiskey, some expansion of the definition of what's considered good in addition to transparency would be valuable here and could kind of accomplish all of the things except for the supply <laughs> problem, which will which will persist. Yeah, absolutely. Usually I ask for like a fun fact or some sort of interesting tidbit I can share with with someone about the topic we're talking about. But I think listeners really deserve something pretty practical here. I would love to hear about your favorite cocktail to make with Japanese whiskey and how how you make that. What's your recommendation to us? Well, so the very standard issue cocktail is the the Japanese whiskey highball, which is very it's a very simple, just a whiskey soda. But you know, Japanese whiskey, as I said, you know, it, it doesn't have this very thick heavy peat flavor of, of scotch. And so you can actually mix it quite well with anything. Um, personally, I am a big lover, a great lover of Manhattans, which is uh, whiskey and sweet vermouth um, stirred over ice and with, a, with a little bit of bitters and um, stirred and, and strained and served in a, a martini glass with a maraschino cherry in the bottom. I love that one. And certainly Japanese whiskey would be a, a great option for that. Yeah, it's probably a good place to start on. Thank you so much for joining me, Tim. <laughs> this was great. My pleasure, Kira. Thank you so much. That's our obsession for the week. This episode was produced by Katie Jane Cornelius. Our sound engineer is George Drake, and the theme music is by Taka Yazuzawa and Alex Sukira. Special thanks to reporter Tim McDonald in Cairo and editor Alex Osla in New York. If you liked what you heard, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. Tell your friends about us. Buy a bottle of Japanese whiskey, invite them over, and listen together. Then head to qz.com slash obsession to sign up for Quartz's weekly obsession email and browse hundreds of interesting backstories. stories.